It's another Friday. New music, man. What's going on with you, Coop? New music. <laughs> yes. Finally got some new music going on, man. Welcoming everybody into the room. We're going to be talking about this new uh, Conway the Machine. We're going to be talking about this new Cardi B record to drop. This new J.I.D. record, again, that features Conway again, um, as well. Right. Not again, but um, what else dropped? It was the new Ice Cube, too. What were some right. of your thoughts on um, the Conway, just first reactions after hearing it uh, for the first time? First reaction, it was better than uh, No One Mourns the Wicked project that uh, Big Ghost, LTD, and Conway did together last year. <laughs> it's Me- better? Media thoughts were... Yeah, it's better. They upped the ante. Mm. Yeah. I love, like, like, my second listen to it was that, oh, yeah, this is going to stay with me. I can ride through this a little bit more. Yo, man, when I turned it on, you know, and, and Griselda Records normally do that, and I know people think we big up Griselda heavy, but they stay crazy consistent with it, you know? And, like... They stay working, too. You know, he's picking up right where he left off, and it feels like, you know, he keeps getting better. Hey, shout out to everybody in the room, people coming in the room. Shout out to... uh. Bad News Brown representing uh, 116. I'm sorry, not 116. 716. 116. Yeah, but anyway, it reminds me of like when I heard um, that West Side Gun Fly Guy 2 for the first time. I came in it with not a lot of expectations. It's like, yo, I'm going to listen to this. And I'm sitting here riding to it like, yo, man, this is hard. Mm-hmm. This is hard. I think I told you that. But... Uh, before we get into that, because that's a full project, but uh, Cardi B just dropped a new single um, called Up, and she dropped a video on top of it, and I don't know if it's, you know, because it's the top of the year, and they're preparing to actually put out a record on Cardi, but uh, what were some of your first reactions on it? Uh, it's a solid record. Uh, you can, I mean, it definitely sounds a little offsetish, like we were talking, like, behind right. the scenes. I definitely feel his influence actually on the hook more than anywhere else. It's like I can kind of hear it in the bars and in the pattern, but on the hook is where I actually hear him. Like, what? Yeah. I mean, I want to know your thoughts too, because you're. I mean, you're the Migos fan. I mean, you're <laughs> in tune with, I mean, you are. You're more in tune yeah. with their style than I am. It's like I heard him on the hook. I heard him delivery wise on the bars a little bit too, but I wasn't sure. Well, when I heard the record, I was immediately thinking like, yo, the Offset write this? And whatever, you know, she he writes for her a lot of, I mean, they're married, they could just be collaborating, whoever, whatever. But my first thing was like, yo, it's been three years since Amigo album, and, you know, they usually don't wait this long. Like, this is the longest gap that they've ever done. They usually came, came with music on a consistent basis year after year, hits year after year. And, um, yeah, it feels like since he's been with Cardi, it's kind of slowed down that group. And I don't know if that's because, you know, he's working with his wife more than he's working with, you know, his groupmates to actually put together records. But, yeah, that was one of my first thoughts of it, too. And, again, I mean, like you said, she's a superstar. and Her stuff's going to hit anyway. And if he is getting some sort of writing credits not only is that you know credited to him as an individual but that's his wife so that stays in the household and you know they got a child together and that is way more lucrative if you want to look at it in those terms than working with your original group so saying all that to say i mean it feels like the more cardi stuff that we're gonna get the less migo stuff we're gonna get and I didn't think that group would break up because they're family. But again, this is a new family. So. <clears throat> That's actually a lot to unpack that you just dropped, Mike. I mean, we actually can work in a, in reverse. You know what I mean? Right. I hate to get biblical, but, you know, a uh, man is supposed to leave his mother and father. And, you know, so, right, you know, right. his ties, so, his, so his ties are to his wife. Of you know course. What I mean, so that's his family, but his ties are to his wife. And so let's talk briefly about, uh, to quote P- EPMD, uh, business never personal. Right. Uh, it's a wise and financially solvent business move for their family and for the generational wealth of their family for him mm-hmm. to help her career flourish. Right. Because she's a bigger star in terms of how she trends beyond music than they are. And definitely him as a solo act. 
And so it's really a wise business decision. It's not personal. Wow. And also, too, I mean, Mike, they've made the kind of hit hip hop records that are going to carry for a long, long time, right. going to get them royalties for a long, long time, and that they're going to be able to hop up and perform years later when everybody's careers in a star have been uh, substantially. Well, I think they were one of the groups, Migos, uh, were one of the groups that were really affected by 2020's pandemic of, A, not having live performances like that, and B, people being inside and actually not being out clubbing and partying and stuff. And the fact that they are artists that are in major deals. So they kind of had to stay put. Um, and so that was like a whole nother year off. Just based on what they were kind of rolling out last year. It felt like the Migos were going to drop last year. At least that was the plan before, you know, the pandemic hit. And, right. um, you know, and on the flip side, you have crews like Griselda who really rely off of their, you know, grassroots type approach. And it's not even about the live performances or clubbing to that stuff. They were able to flourish in a year like that. Um, saying all that to say, as, as fast as that news cycle works in that, um, that arena with the people who are, how do we say it? I don't want to say mumble rappers because I don't feel like Migos are mumble rappers. I think they're artists of the digital era. And that works so fast that if you're yeah, taking you three, you three years off, seems like six years off with the amount of people that are coming while you're taking your time off, you know? And then it buries it even more when Cardi comes with something. And so, I don't know. So, I mean... I, so I want to speak to something. Mm -hmm. You uh, you spoke about how maybe music-wise what they do and also them being major label tie doesn't work for them when this pandemic hit. Right. Well, look what she did during the pandemic. She went beyond the music and made sure her shine, her, her star was still burning. And not only that, it actually got brighter because you actually had Cardi B beginning to speak out on social issues during a pandemic. Yeah, <laughs> and was actually and it was actually saying some relevant and conscious and valid things, Mike. She wasn't like talking out the side of her neck. I mean, was he writing that for her as well? Well, she comes from the the world of being a personality, so that that was home for her. You know what I'm saying? I'm, like, I'm, I mean, that's that, that that's yeah. a different world when you're when you're choosing to delve into social issues, Mike. I mean, ask Kaepernick. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, yeah. she did, but didn't. You know, she kind of just spoke like you know what her feelings on were going on. Right. But she they, some you, every, she bought she bought some yeah. every day to it, Mike. Yeah, she, she brought did. some every day to it, and yeah. you know, and with the release of WAP, you know, that was I think that was a. That was strategically planned to keep her out there musically and keep her relevant, and it worked. Um, but this new one doesn't feel like it's one of those shock value things in that way. It feels like they're gearing up for an album. And if they're gearing up for an album, saying all this stuff to say, her and Offset either have already put in a lot of work for an album or there's going to be work put in, which takes that time away from you know, his group. So I don't even know if we're going to see uh, Amigos' album this year unless it's some stuff that they've already recorded and accumulated over time. I mean, there's probably some of that stuff. I agree with you on mm -hmm. that. Uh, let me ask you something. Yeah. Do you think this is like a legit, legit single and like push single or are they just kind of testing the waters and seeing what the vibe is and what wave people are going to catch to this record? I think it's a, it's a legit attempt i think they're gonna go all in for it i think that the super bowl okay. is sunday i wouldn't be surprised if we right. saw this record in some of the possible commercials um, or she's in the commercial yeah or she's in the commercial so just the timing of it all and just the fact that it's just her and you know they already probably trying to gear up some challenges with it i think that this is you know a legit single for them to push you know, for an upcoming album. Okay. Now, another person to drop. I think, I, think, I, think, I, I think it's solid, but I would question whether if it's actually, like, how about this? For for, uh, for for her star caliber, for her star power, Right. this feels more second single than first single-ish to me off the listen that I had, but I only listened once. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the best she can do at this time. I mean, Mike, she did make the song of the year once upon a time. I mean, let's not... When was that? 
Bodak, Bodak Yellow was the biggest song of the year when it came out, Mike. It was Even huge. I, that. I think she's still no, riding off I mean, of that. I think it's going to be the biggest song I mean, of her Mike, career. I, mean, I don't I think mean, she can top that. It, it, it was the biggest rap song that year, though, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I mean, and it spawned one of the biggest rap stars, you know, in current time. So, yeah, it was a big song. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't know if she. Could... Your life, man. Yeah, I don't know if she could top that though. But oh, no, she won't be topping that. That's not what I'm saying. Right, right. But I'm just saying I don't think that that song is indicative to her ability to be consistent. And you know what? Since we're talking about hit records or whatever, and I know we're gonna talk about uh, Ice Cube's new record or new single. Did you catch all that stuff that was going on with uh, Nelly and Ali about country oh, yeah. drama? I actually did actually catch all of that. I found it to be fascinating. And I, I had some back end ties to that once upon a time. I found it to be fascinating too that that was all Saint Lunatic's writing. I guess the second verse, which was Nelly's real mm -hmm. verse, was mm -hmm. him. But was the hook Nelly? I guess it's that. But listen, at the end of the day, they didn't write Ride With Me uh, or E.I. But does that make, does that change anything for you? Like, because that's, that's a big single. It doesn't change anything for me, Mike. Mm -hmm. And here's why. Originally, when I heard Nelly, E.I. was the first single. Okay. When they heard Country Grammar after Country Grammar got made, they pushed Country Grammar to the front. I always thought E.I. was a better record than Country Grammar fundamentally, and I still feel that way to this day. And I know that Nelly made E.I. like has the, like when they're talking about like the, when he went and made the records. Right. I'm fairly certain has it was told to me like directly, like on the back end of somebody that knew them early, early on, mm -hmm. like like right after all this popped off. That like, yeah, like E.I. was one of them songs that he went and made without them. Right, And right. that was the song that really got him on and that they were looking at at the first single. So it doesn't change anything for it for me. Yeah, I mean, I guess I always feel kind of funny when, you know, it's like rappers are out there rapping somebody else's raps. I mean, it just, rap seems to be such a one-on-one -on -one thing. And it's not one of those things where you're writing for a singer that has vocal ability that you don't have. And see, I don't like when people try to correlate the whole, oh, well, Whitney Houston had writers. No, it's not the same thing. Because at the end of the day, rappers aren't hitting notes. You know what I'm saying? And songwriters... Like, and, like, like, not doing runs every day. Right. <laughs> and, you know, and, it, and it's disrespectful to the craft of songwriting. Because, honestly... Once upon a time, songwriting was just an actual job. You had the performer, the well, the artist, performer, whatever you want to call it, and you had the songwriter, you had the producer, you had the musician. Yeah, you, you know what I'm saying? Here. And yeah. so the fact that people try to correlate those two is not the same thing. Songwriters could be a person who can't hold a note, but they know the song structure, know how to put things together, and just because a person has a really good voice doesn't make them a songwriter. Now, when it comes I to mean, rapping, like, I mean, it's different. You're not I mean, hitting like, no notes. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, I still do think that... I told you, Mike, writing a rap song is very hard. I think it's one of the hardest things to do in songwriting because of the amount of words that you have to put into the format of a 16-bar song in terms of making it work. That's why right. people who can extend their flow sound really good to you on record because it sounds more musical a la a biggie a jay-z a tupac a method man where they can literally extend the words extend their voice right it makes the bars seem longer well let me ask you this musical. hello yeah i'm listening yeah my bad it was a delay or whatnot but let me ask you this in what case with somebody who's not like a producer beat maker or whatever in what case would somebody be like, yo, man, I need you to write my rhymes, or why don't you write rhymes for this person? Because, like, it's not one of them things in rap where it's like the ghostwriter is just one of those guys who doesn't have a voice for rap, but this person who doesn't write does have a voice. You know what I mean? Because normally I mean, the ghostwriter raps too. Most, more often than not, right. I mean, I. 
I, I mean, and I don't know how it goes per se now, but I know once upon a time, it was really more like the label put things like that together. So I don't know how those relationships work now, but that was more of a CEO label A&R thing that was put together, you know, in the 90s, in the early 2000s. Right. And I would say I don't know how that operation totally works now. I think one of the things that was fascinating about uh, Drake and uh, what, what was the guy's name? Um, 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 it'll come to me in a second. Uh, everybody. That's cool. But the way that he sourced the songs out from him was something that would just like, let me know. It's like, oh, it's a whole new day, even with like the ghostwriting shit. You know what I mean? Reference tracks and stuff like that. It's like, it used to be like, how about this? Like one of the stories that gets told is, is like, you know, Columbia wanted Nas to come and sit in with Will Smith when mm-hmm. he was recording Big Willie style. Again, right? a movie star, right? Uh, Quentin Miller is the guy. Yeah, no, everybody in the MC chat. First, here we go with that a movie star. No, thing. I feel you, but I'm just saying you're right. And you know what? Since we're talking about Will Smith, and I don't want to go too much on a tangent, I was listening to Summertime yesterday, and I believe Will Smith when he says that he that Rakim didn't write that. He was just trying to sound like Rakim because I was listening to that last verse. I was like, Rakim would have never written that. No, 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 you're right. It's just flow and delivery-wise. Yeah. It's just simple. So, yeah. Sound like the God. I mean, it's, you know, but, yes. what, what form of flattery. Why would, why would Drake have a ghostwriter? You know what I'm saying? Like, that's one of those things where it's like, okay, well, if he has the, him being who he is, right, and him being the person that the label has, you know, invested in, who has hit after hit, I would trust your skill set more than, Quentin Miller's right, like what? There we go, Quentin Miller. You know what I mean? What would make an artist get a go? That's the thing in rap. Like, if you have a ghostwriter at any point, people question your ability to put together anything and everything you've ever done. Because you know what I'm saying. Like, if you ever had those no. abilities, like let's say Snoop, for instance, right? Snoop had those abilities to, as you said, write the Chronic and Doggy Style. Now. If he did those things, why would I trust anyone to write for him? And right. at that point, if somebody's writing for him, I got to question everything. You know what I'm saying? First of all, Snoop don't need no writers. He wrote The Chronic and Dogs. I never heard no ghostwriting stories about Snoop, have you? I have. But, right. you know, that's, that's hearsay. I'm, I have. Oh, I've heard just so disrespectful. Some, I've heard some LL ones too. I'm not saying they're true. I'm just saying no, I have. No, I've never heard no. no. I've I mean, never heard no. Mike, just getting into his no, no, just getting into his style alone is too no. I don't believe that. But <laughs> what I will say, <laughs> I don't. And you're very shady towards our legends on this show. No, I'm <laughs> trying not to be. I'm just trying to be honest, man. Go ahead. No, I mean so. When you're like, why would he need a ghostwriter? Like, I want to share, like, a psychological part of it because you talked about how rap is supposed to be a one-on-one sport. Like, I'm a big Ten fan and a big boxing fan because they're one-on-one sports. Right. One thing about people who box and people who play tennis, although they're great at what they're doing, they're big stars and they make a lot of money, they're very insecure. Rap is very much the same way. A lot of people who operate in one-on-one sports are the same way. And the insecurities that come with losing your spot and losing your position, oh, I can see very clearly why somebody like Drake may be sourcing out inspiration to make sure that a run like his keeps on going. It's a one-on-one sport. So it's like steroids. Mike, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. It's like steroids, (laughs) where it's like, okay, I'm coming off of an injury, and, you know, to make sure I get back in the full form, a la Mark McGuire after his rookie year, after hitting 49 home runs out the gate, you're coming off of an injury. Huh? I thought it was 47. Was 49. it 47? Something like that. He did something I thought, I thought, crazy I thought, I thought his rookie I thought he went 47, 49 back. Wait, yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. No, nah, his rookie year, whatever. But yeah, he got hurt his second year. And that's kind of what started that. And so I guess when you get that writer's block and you have so many people depending on you to, you know, bring them a hit, maybe you do bring in somebody for, you know, inspiration or... Uh, to get you going in a direction. And honestly, I think that's what happened with Kanye. With him bringing in Sa I, mean, I, I mean, Mike, but can I speak to something right quick? That's what great producers and executive production is supposed to be for, though. Yeah, I like, agree. 
like when you work when you work with people or a team of people that give you a framework of inspiration to go off of or even just i mean you got to do stuff when you're an artist it's like you got to go hear a live jazz band you need to go play some records one day with your producers you need to go sit and vibe with your guys one day like you just can't be sitting in the yo like i gotta make this hit today i don't think that i'm gonna be honest man and no offense in our culture i don't think we have a lot of great producers we have a lot of great beat makers but when we talk about people who go and do what uh jimmy jam and terry lewis did with janet jackson and actually picked their brain and came together with control based on getting to know her and all that stuff. We don't have a lot of people to do that. We got a lot Why of people in, in hip-hop that just ship you beats. Why is that? I think that's because it's not rooted on actual musicians making things from scratch. I think it's rooted on the fact that we're ripping from different samples and ripping from other inspirations, which is dope. But it, it loses that ground up organic okay. feel so it's like you're shipping people right. beats instead of actually producing them and i think that's right, why that's dr dre's the, projects come out the way they do because i think he's one of the few actual producers pharrell and chad too no i don't know i it with fame but this okay so let's go back to the artist though so some of that is on you to seek out some of the inspiration that's why it's like oh no you need to go hear some live music like that's the first thing i said i said live music for a reason because most of mm -hmm. your inspiration are being drawn from things that have been taken from guess what somebody who's already played it live why but don't what, you go hear some shit live but like you said that's traditionally in other genres that's the producer's job and rappers are kind of acting as their own producers well, you know what well, i'm how saying about this? How, well how about this you know um I think it's pretty safe to say Dr. Dre is widely considered to be the best executive producers of albums in hip hop history because he's just got too many classics to list right. that he has executive produced. Okay, so one of the things that you'll hear about Dr. Dre is how he'll bring what? Live musicians into the studio. I bought up how Hector Elizondo played guitar on the Chronic 2001 mic. He was in there on the sessions. Like, Dre knows what he's doing. He goes and pulls that inspiration live when he could afford to. First, he wanted upgraded equipment. See, then he got to the point that he could afford all the equipment that he wanted. Then he wanted musicians. This is the thing. And yes, music is one thing. But what Dr. Dre has done a great job of is he actually produces these artists. Like, he set the groundwork for what Snoop Dogg still is today. Like, he's known for that whole super fly type of figure because Dr. Dre set that groundwork from doggy style. You know what I'm saying? Like, he actually produced Eminem in a way that other producers would have just given Eminem beats. He gave Eminem his image. He gave him his, you know, his outlet and the way he was going to present himself. No one else does that in hip-hop like that. No, they no, just no, give Mike, you Mike. beats and tell you to run with it. No, Mike, I, I, I'll tell you this. For anybody... Who, if you heard them really for the first time, you heard them rapping over Dr. Dre's beats. That's who they are to you still to this day. Yeah. Every last one of them. Yeah. 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 And, you Spot know, and, and that's the job of a producer. And like you said. That's the um, job of a producer. Yeah. You know, we just don't have enough of that in hip hop. And so it's like, you know, when people lose that inspiration, they might go out there and get a writer. Where, like you so, said, so. that is the producer's job to pull that out of you. I think Kanye pulls that out of people. So, I, so, so no, no, no. I, 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 I already know you're gonna go to Kanye. You're gonna go to the Neptunes. You're probably gonna go to Dilla. You're probably gonna go to RZA. I'm gonna Dr. go Dre too. Dre. I don't even know about RZA, man. I mean, you know, it's been a long time since RZA has been able to do that. You know what I'm saying? I think all those guys were collectively in a zone, and I think I he mean, gave like, them I think, the soundtrack. I think he's the only guy. I mean. Yeah, Mike, but when you say that, I think he's the only guy other than Dr. Dre that probably has produced five of the 50 greatest albums ever made. I will give you that. And right. I will also give you the fact right. that he so, was able to hone in a group with like nine other members, too. I mean, that's not no, easy. I, mean, to I was do. about to say that that's part of the pull off. It's like, you know, it's like when you, Mike, when you hear the purple tape. Liquid with Swords and Iron Man in succession. It's just like, I mean, that's masterful. Drake can't even pull that off, Mike. Andre, in I... Of, in, 
we got Andre Shasir in here, and uh, I was gonna say I was gonna get into that. He said West Side Gun is a hell of an executive producer, and yes, I feel like West Side is one of those guys who hones his guys in in ways where he can get them inspired that a lot of artists in hip hop just don't have. You could tell Mike, when he's so, involved. No, Mike, so I want to actually make a transition and now we can get to talking about Conway and the Big Ghost LTD project. Let's talk about it. One of the most striking things to me about the Conway project is I think he's taking a cue from his young brother in the sense that I'm starting to notice that he is starting to become masterful at crafting these projects and picking the beats the yeah. way his brother does. He's getting better at it. Like from a king to a god in this project, one thing that I like about it is that the beat selections for him are damn near flawless. That's one of the yeah. things that his brother executes so well on. He's a superior MC than his brother. So when he starts executing behind the scenes stuff as well as his brother, oh man. When you say his Hold brother, you're speaking about West Side, right? West Side, yeah. Okay. Talking about gun. Yeah. All right, yeah. Gun. Um, listen, um, I think that. Like you said, I think you said this in one of the shows last year. I think Benny is probably out of the three the weaker beat picker. Um, I didn't love the choice of having Hit Boy do the whole project. Uh, I, hopefully, because he has a project coming up. Benny has a project coming up with um, who's the producer? I'm I'm tripping. Um, he worked with plugs I met too, right? What's that? Is it plugs I met too? It's not plugs I met too. Um, well, I think it is, but. I forgot who he said was doing the whole thing. He worked with French Montana a lot. I'm tripping. He made... Uh, yeah, I know. I know it'll come in a minute. It's not coming off the top of my head. I mean, still, I, I don't know if that's the answer. Harry Fraud. Thank you, Andre. Uh, Harry yeah, Fraud yeah, is the producer. Fraud. But see, that right there lets me know that he's relying on one producer to hone his, his whole sound and his whole project. Where Westside doesn't have to do that. He can get a variety of producers and get everybody on the same page. So that's so that's what I was about to say with Conway on a from King to a God, he did that. Yeah. I told you like I mean, Mike, it was right there with Pray for Paris. Pray for Paris is put together a little bit better. Uh, I mean, ly lyrically it's not a question. Uh, C Conway's taking the cake on that. Right. But what he's showing between from a king to a god in this project is that I'm great when you just give me one producer now. Mm -hmm. I'm great when you give me a period of producers now. And here's what I mean. Last year's projects, the Big Ghost LTD, No One Mourns the Wicked, and the Lulu Project, mm -hmm. they're not fucking with this project. Like, even in a year's time, I think those projects dropped around March and April, respectively, last year. Right. In about nine, to, in nine, ten months' time, Mike, just the beats that he is picking. Yep. Like, all of these beats are better than the beats on Lulu, which Alchemist produced solely in the Big Ghost LTD, No One, no One Mourns the Wicked Project from last year. And he took on more of the bars on this project than the last project, which makes it more entertainment. And, and also, too, yeah. Mike, you know, Conway's a loyal dude. This speaks to the loyalty. Uh, the Griselda Ghost Project is one of the first projects uh, him and Westside did that kind of got their run going in 2015. That was yep. with Big Goat. Yep. So he kind of stays down home team and is loyal to that first project with him. And West Side and Big Goat goes back to 2015. Uh, Andre so says good that good that Benny needs to stick with uh, um, Derringer and Alchemist. I I mean I agree. And Beat Butcher. And Beat Butcher, but I think uh, Benny wants to take a different direction. I think he wants to prove that he could do it without so much help. But as fans, we really want to hear. Uh, those records and we want to hear those people involved when you're saying without mike when you're saying without so much help it's like the first thing i thought about it's like i thought about the production credits on illmatic like, right. what's wrong with help well you know what <laughs> illmatic and since we're talking about being produced and i've said this before and it's no disrespect to anybody i feel like that was the last time Nas was actually produced on right. a full effort and I feel like again not sitting the only one because no. we say no, this no, no, all no, the no, time no. it's a whole narrative in hip hop such and such is a good beat picker it's like rappers are they are basically given the whole onus to be their own uh, executive producers or basically be their own producers you know what I'm saying you know so we got beat makers out here go ahead 
it's not even that cats didn't get used to produce mike it's who you choose to roll with like you want to know what i actually went and listened to i am mm -hmm. for the first time in a long time and i remembered what some of my first thoughts was about i am which came out when i was in high school you know what i thought when i heard i am what's that this nigga need to fire steve stout right now <laughs> but but see steve fire stout's not a musician right you know what i'm saying that is the what he is like after i heard i am like the shit that came out i was like go ahead and fire him but go that's him go. The, again it's happening fast the decline's happening fast Fuck <laughs> that dude. let that shit go fire him fire because really Rick Ross is pretty much an executive producer of his own. Like, we would, if Rick Ross was executive producing somebody's project, we'd be like, cool. But that's what hey, I'm Mike, saying. Artists, are, know, rappers are expected to be their own executive producers. No. Mike, you know the most, you know the thing that excited me the most that I heard the last three years is Rick Ross quoted one day, he said, I want to executive produce Nas' next album. I was like, have See? at it. Please. Yeah. Like, I please. Mean, like go. You know Damn. who's another example of that too? I think T.I. I think if T.I. actually got with somebody who would really produce him and bring the best out of him and actually, I won't say bring the best out of him, exploit the areas where he is best at and craft something around that, he would be able to put out a, a very masterful project. And hey, I think hey, the last one he put oh. out was good but it was all over the place. You know what I'm saying? Hey, Mike, I have a, I have a question for you because I've always asked myself this question. Mm -hmm. Who's the best producer for Tip? Who would you like to hear Tip rhyming over beat-wise most consistently? Because, Mike, this is Based what we Based on like, his work about, or what like, I think? No, Mike, this, based on... No, 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 not even... Based on neither one of those. Based on what we know about him and what we said when we said he is probably the most complete MC to ever come out of the South. Mm-hmm. I will say so this. With, so with his repertoire of tools, who pairs best with him? Because he has a repertoire of tools that really nobody in the South has ever displayed. He's like that. I agree with Andre Shashir uh, here again. Uh, DJ Toomp, I think he's done his most organic work with. I think that... That's not what I asked you. <laughs> okay, so you're asking me just in a vacuum, or are you in saying just based on what has been made? Yeah, based on his skill set, what he brings to the table, who would he sound best with? Uh, like, I know we got evidence of two. Oh, okay. You know. I mean, like, I so it. even if we're talking yeah. about even if it's somebody that he hasn't really worked with like that. Yes. Yeah, the table's open right uh, now. The table's I, open. One of, my things about, one of my things about him that I think has hurt his all-time crime, I think he has top 10 all-time capability and comparable catalog. Yeah. But I don't feel like he's made enough work with other guys who maybe could have bought out some more of the greatness in him. You know the sad part about him, and I'm going to give you my answer, but the sad part about him is the fact that I have said that the Neptunes are, you know, this and that when it comes to being able to put together uh, a craft projects and actually produce somebody. I don't think that him and the Neptunes have ever reached their potential together, and I think that bothers Pharrell. I think that's why he really? keeps trying. He keeps trying to actually get that out, but I don't think that they have really maximized on what they both can do. You know what I mean? Like, if you yes, but no. The thing yes, is, no. like, if you mention his top, his best twenty records, one of their records wouldn't be in there. If you mention the Neptune's best fifty records, none of his records would be in there. But they worked so much, and it's like they keep trying to get it, but it doesn't happen. But my answer to your question would be Dr. Dre, actually. I think I think I he has a skill set. You said Dre. I think Dre could get the what, best what, out of him. What, 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 what records have they done together besides What's Your Name and Freak, though? They did. I'm serious. They did Pussy Popper okay. number one. The, he, yeah, that's what The your Neptunes name. did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Neptunes did, did his. Why You Wanna? Is that. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Okay. They did, kind of they did Hear Ye, Hear Ye together. They've done a lot of records that have fallen on deaf ear. And that's the thing. Hey, hey I, I was actually about to say, though, Mike, I was actually about to say Freak, though, is probably one of my favorite 20 T.I. records. I love T.I. on the record. He's actually very introspective. His pitching and tone and his delivery is different. It's, it's a different take from him. And it's insightful. They don't have that banger together, man. And you oh, they know, don't have the banger, yeah. but they have quality records. Yeah. 
But I mean, when you think of the Neptune's catalog, you think of it. Not like just, the records are yeah. whack. The records aren't whack, Mike. Those are good records, is what I'm saying. Like Freak though is a good record. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, I just don't think they've reached their potential together. I mean, we're talking about the Neptunes, and like you said, we're talking about the most complete uh, artist or MC to ever come out of the South. Hey, they don't Mike, have a I'm, give I'm, it I'm, to me. I'm going to throw you for a loop, Mike. I would have loved to hear him work with David Banner more. I like that. I wanted to hear him do more work with David Banner. Uh, but you know what? If you want to go there, though, I really think that him and Jazzy Faye worked great together. Yeah. They sound they did what very they good together. together. Yeah. yeah. I thought they did. Though. Yeah. And he said, the thing is, he sounds very comfortable on those records. He sounds very comfortable on Toomp records, too. But, you know, um, Toomp stuff can kind of get a little bit repetitious. Oh, Mike, he's versatile. He sounds yeah. comfortable on anything. He sounds comfortable with Swiss with the Jay Z sample. That's what I mean when I'm saying right. he's complete. Well, Andre yeah. just put out another good one. What do you think about Tip and Organized Noise? Mike, that was my that was my initial thought, but mm -hmm. you you know what? I'm struggling with organized noise because it's like after Southern Playalistic and Soul Food. Like, do, do you <laughs> trust them to do Tips Project? Uh, I will say this: the last tips super versatile two Tips super versatile, Mike. I think Cool Breeze East Point's greatest hits was very dope. Um. No, Mike, you're right about that. I'm sorry. I forgot yeah. about that. Uh, but I, I, I love organized noise. I'm just, yeah. I'm just stating some facts here. Think about Tip's caliber. I, I think, man, like I said, Dr. Like, Dre. Like, how about this? How about this? Walking into that studio, they would be underdogs in the situation walking into that studio, not him. You feel me? I think Dr. Dre could hone into some things in T.I. that he didn't even know he had. And that's what I'm talking yeah. about. I'm talking about bringing out some stuff that he didn't have. How yeah. about this, Mike? It's like how I feel about uh, Nas when he raps over Havoc's beats. Havoc brings something out in him, like that nasty Nas grime. Like, I want somebody to bring something out in Tip that maybe we're not seeing or don't see too often. And I got like, another Jeff one, Blaze, and maybe like I'm Jeff biased, Blaze, but Jeff I would like. Blaze did it when I'm talking to you. He did, like, and like Just that. Blaze is more yeah. of a beat maker than a producer. And, you know. Kanye showed what he could do with Tip on I'm Just Doing My Job and Want to Be Your Man. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm Just Doing My Job is great. It's not great. I'm, I'm so Just Doing My Job is that. great. It's one of my favorite T.I. Yeah. records, period. No, that's... Mike, if it makes my top 20, it's like on the back end. I love I'm Just Doing My Job. It's, it's very introspective, but... It's solid. I think that um, I would like to see Q-Tip. I mean, I think that would be a good one, too. I think Q-Tip musically could bring in certain thing, bring out certain things in T.I.'s flow that he didn't know was there. Hey, Mike, that's crazy. He crossed my mind, too. I was actually scared to say it because I thought I was thinking crazy. Nah, I think that would be really dope. Because, I mean, what Q-Tip was able to do with Mob Deep, uh, the infamous, you right, know. Right, away the pain. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, I he was very integral. He a and R'd he a and the infamous pretty much, right? He did A&R and, and Infamous. There, and he was there for Illmatic, so, like, he know his hardcore East Coast shit. Like, he, yeah. I mean, he's the reason why the Infamous actually came together in the way it did. And for what I understand, what uh, Havoc was saying, he mixed a lot of like those records, too. Like to say thank you. Yeah, so. Like to say thank you. He was a big, big fan of the Infamous. <laughs> All right, back to Conway. Like, let's talk about the best MC in the game right now. Okay, so, um, I mean, what, what are you rating this album on, like, a one to five? I give up the goods was first. crazy. Yeah, I'm sorry. Huh? I'm sorry. Andre said give yeah, up the goods. The goods. Yeah, Q tip did. Mike, yeah, Q tip I mean, did. That, that whole, too. Mike, yeah. that whole album, like the start of your end. Mike, I still know. The, I know the sequence to the album, Mike. Yeah, yeah. Start of your end in forty first side in parentheses. Yeah. Yeah. Interlude between survival of the fittest, I four and I. The give up the goods interlude where big noise yeah. freestyle and acapella give up the goods. Yo, big big noise kill give up the goods too. He killed Big Give Up the Goods. You know what else he killed? He killed, uh, he killed, he killed Burning off of Infamy. Yeah. Burning, Burn. I love Burn, actually. See how it's going down. It's on now. Niggas want to, but yeah. they can't forget me now. Yeah. 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 No, he's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what are you rating this on uh, 1 to 5, um, This, if it bleeds? I mean, Mike, aren't you hearing a 4? You I'm hearing a, a very solid four here, man. Like, yeah, it's a very good four, Mike. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I wouldn't put it higher than that. 
it's uh lyrically he's not uh from a king to a god type of performance but he's in the realm like it's like he didn't like from a king to a god is like when somebody goes and averages 35 points in a season so he didn't yeah yeah so the thing bad, is though it's like, it's like but it's like 28 <laughs> he hasn't even dropped his shady album though you know what i'm saying like he hasn't even That's dropped what i mean yeah I thought it was good practice rounds too. I was like, man, if these are his practice rounds, his practice rounds Crazy. is better either. It's like if this is a prep for the real album, because one of the things that I noticed is that he got very introspective as the album went along. I like, was I was gonna say on, that too. Yeah. He touched on Shay yep. a lot. He touched on his depression. He touched on his loneliness. Mike, he said something about being even paranoid about going out and fucking with people because he got shot. You know what yeah. I mean? He got shot a long time ago. So he kind of let you inside of his mind more. Mike, he even he let you know. He talked about Machine Gun, thing. too. He talked about Machine Gun. He even let you know for the second time, like, I did that to him. Those dudes are not, those dudes are not all right that did that, Mike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, like that wasn't that wasn't no situation where like there was no retaliation. Like he letting you know who he is too. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. But see, that's so, the thing, man. Andre said uh, four point two five. You know, that's the thing though that I love about Conway in particular. And we spoke about this. I want to say when we did our top twenty five living MCs, he really lets you into who he is. And at this point. You feel like, what more can I learn? And he's still giving you things. And, you know, a lot of people be saying that, you know, we're hard on certain artists when they put out albums. But it's like, when you put out an album, a collection of work, you know, whether it be 10 songs or more, somewhere around that era, we want to know something about you, man. Like, this is an opportunity, especially for new artists. It's an opportunity to get people into who you are. You know, and right. a lot of people miss that opportunity and you know, Conway's basically showing how it's done. So if you just if you're just now listening to Conway just now, you know a lot where you can go back and listen to some more. It's a it's like a, a series, you know what I'm saying? So Mike, so I'm glad that you brought that up if you're just now listening to Conway. So today when I downloaded this project, Mike, I want mm -hmm. people to understand this. This is the twelfth Conway project that I have in my library. Mm. He's got a catalog. It's ridiculous. There was a reason that we had him ranked above DMX. The catalog is why. And just yeah. so we're fair, I'm gonna tell you, and I'm and I'm gonna tell you what type of head I am, Mike. Just because I know how Conway be coming. Right. I went and I listened to "It's Dark" and "It's Hell Is Hot" last night. Mm -hmm. That's the hardest shit ever, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> It is, man. I say, Mike, I don't care what nobody has to say. Like, Mike, it's the hardest ever. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Period. Dot, dot, dot. It's the hardest shit ever. It's but amazing. Conway's, no, no, Mike. It, like, it's I was amazing. like, okay, like, I'm pretty certain this. Like, Mike, when you get done listening to it, you're like, no, I don't think there's 10 better rap albums than this, and there's definitely nothing harder than this ever made. Well, I think but, what happened, man, the pace of music changed so much that... You know, certain people in certain eras didn't get it. Well, they didn't come out with as much music, right? So the Bro. few amounts of music they came out with has such an impact that people discount the folks that are coming out frequently. Like, you don't have an album with this impact, but the, the game's different. You know what I'm no. saying? No, 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 Mike, it is. But here's what I was about to submit mm -hmm. to you when I was saying that about it's dark and as hell is hot. Oh, that like Mike. It's we playing darts. Oh, that's a bullseye. You getting you getting you know that's a bullseye in the middle. Right. Okay. And and if you want to take a flesh of my flesh and blood of my blood, and even and then there was X because that's pretty solid. And there was some X on there too. Right. Oh, them is close to some bullseyes. But Conway got twelve projects now, Mike. In about seven, eight of those projects, Mike. I mean. Mm -hmm. They all right around the bullseye. They all right and around king, there, yeah. They all right around the bullseye, Mike. Yeah. From a king to a god is like, it's not that in the center bullseye that it's dark and hell is hot is, but it's one of those bullseyes that kind of leans and hangs on the side of the edge of the bullseye. looks like it's about to fall off, but it still yeah. counts for the points all the same. And then you start looking at the stuff that he got around the bullseye. That's why he was ahead of DMX on our list. I think what people don't understand as well is the fact that Let's just say hypothetically, if uh, From a King to a God came out in 99, 97, 
it would have ruled that whole year and probably lasted a year and a half on singles alone just based on how the game was structured back then. Yeah. The fact yeah, that we're, you're not going to get records that last as long as those records anymore because the industry just not built in that way anymore. Music comes and goes too fast. So to no, actually here, measure it on that level is just unfair. No, I think it is fair because here is why. Here is one thing that I realize. Like what Conway is doing, like specifically because he's a New York rapper, oh, a lot of his lane exists because it's dark and hell is hot came out. Like, Mike, I, I went and listened to Get At Me Dog for about three times straight last night. Like love just that record. the rhymes. Mm-hmm. No, 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 I love that record. One of the best rap songs ever. So it stopped being greedy. Like, I just mm-hmm. listened to what he was saying in, in the song, Mike. Like, if ever there was a song that had no business not only not being a single, but mm-hmm. not even being a record that got released. Like, Mike, he's starting off... <laughs> what you're saying? Like, Mike, he's saying, like, he's saying some wild shit. Yeah, yeah, I know what you were going like, to say. Saying, but no, yeah, like, I mean... He's the... not even saying no regular street shit. Like, he's saying some hungry, stick-up kid, like, robbing you tonight. Like, when you mm-hmm. get off of work type... Like, it's real dark. It's dark I mean, the thing not, is, like... it was put out... <laughs> Right. It was put out to be a game changer. That was what it was. It wasn't put out there to possibly exist. It was put out there to be a game changer. And it had to be as gritty and as raw as possible because the game had gotten too polished at that point. Mike, yeah, talking on single, talking about lucky that you bleeding, but you dead from the waist down. Fuck is on your mind talking that shit that you be talking. It's a rap single, Mike. (laughs) I mean, you know what that single reminds me of, though, as far as approach goes? It reminds me of incarcerated Scarfaces. Like, that that wasn't about no melodies, no nothing. It was just hardcore. No, 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 no. no. It is, but it's harder than that, Mike. Even harder than that. It's harder. It's harder than that because of his approach. But yeah, it's very, they're all very dark. I mean, it's harder than that because of what he's saying. I was going to say the approach and, and the message. Like, Mike, I, I listened to that album. I was like, yo, this content is way more disturbing in my 30s than it was in my teenage <laughs> years. Like, Fucking with D was hard, too. That's one of the best records on there. Yeah. Track three? Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, track three. Yeah. Really? So, so the Rough Riders, Riders anthem, anthem was the happiest record on there. I mean, how's it going down? <laughs> to Rough? Mike, if you take if you take Rough Riders and Anthem and how's it going down off the album, it's like a manic, depressive, schizophrenic album. Yeah, it's... Uh... Boom, boom, yeah. boom. Open the door. ATF. I think it's a... Uh, what? I know you feel very highly about Doggy Style. I know you said top 10 with Dark and Hell is Hot. And you usually say top 5 with Doggy Style. Do you think that uh, Dark and Hell is Hot is a better debut than Doggy Style? I mean, if we're talking... If we're judging it based on debut. I'm not saying which was the better album. Which is the better debut? Snoop maybe had the biggest buzz of all time when Doggy Style came I out. agree like, with you. But you ever. know what? I will Mike, say. The first, Mike, if you, Mike, Snoop's the first artist to debut number one on the Billboard charts for a rap artist. And he spent four weeks there and he moved five million units. I feel ain't you. nobody ever been. No, ain't no. Ever. I the think. buzz ever in rap. Nah, I think the biggest buzz ever was 50 Cent. No. I think it was, yeah. The biggest no. buzz ever was 50. Now, no, Mike. Mike, Mike <laughs> we had the chronic and deep cover to go off of. Yeah. No. <laughs> it's close. No, it's nothing, close. There's nothing, no, no, no. There's nothing that 50 even dropped that even compares to like the buzz that came from when we heard the chronic and deep cover. No. But the thing <laughs> with, with 50, with his buzz, it was I, like... I was, Mike, I was like 10 years old and I remember the buzz. It was crazy. Mike, niggas on Memorial Drive was talking about Snoop shit. 50s Come buzz like, was this crazy. East Side Atlanta, like 91, 92. Like, ain't nobody talking about no West Coast artist around the East Side Atlanta no 91, 92. It's Kilo and Tag Team. <laughs> 50s buzz was crazy, though. And it carried over into other artists, too. Like, you had guys like Lloyd Banks, Yayo, and Buck that were doing gold out the gate just off of 50s momentum. Like, that 50 Cent oh, buzz dang. was crazy. I know what I've seen. No, I feel you. I mean, I think Doggy Style is the best. If we want to talk about Doggy Style and uh, It's Dark and Hell is Hot, I think Doggy Style is the better album. But I think the better debut, I'm going to have to get at the X, man. He did that on his own 
pretty much. I mean, we, we splitting hairs. We talking about an album I probably have ranked like fifth versus an album I have ranked like tenth. Yeah. And so X was know, a force, and so was Snoop. I mean. No, I mean, but I think was, Snoop was more this, of the machine, uh, the machine. The machine was more set up for him to. How about this? Snoop helped build the machine. What like, I will say like, though, rappers weren't moving. Rappers weren't moving five million units. You're right. You're right. Like, Ice Cube wasn't moving five million units. Dre didn't move five million. Units. You're right. You're and right. He had Snoop. You're right. So, so, so he helped create the, the machine that is Interscope for hip hop. Mm-hmm. That's the machine that Snoop Dogg created. That's You're right. What I mean, when I'm saying he wrote the Chronic and Doggy style, there is no Interscope hip hop machine without Snoop. He is the creation of that. When DMX walked into Def Jam, Mike. Mm-hmm. But you know what? I will give you this. DMX. Mike, he, had, he had he had Irv already like no yeah. he already had and he no, was filling the void. The Pac was no longer here too. I don't think he was like filling that. You void don't think he was filling like, that void? No, I think a lot of people just latched to that. I just think there was too much happy shit going on. Yeah, he wasn't yeah. too happy now, was he? Wasn't well, too happy. Now, well, Fifty he? came back and did the same exact thing because things had gotten happy like again. That. Like, like, you no, know, like that was the thing when people said that. It's like I looked at Fifty more as an entertaining gangster artist. I looked at DMX as a real gangster ass. Nigga. Yeah, no, 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 no. I agree with so, you. Hold on, hold on. What that shit? I just so happened to rap. Yeah, that was DMX. It's like, oh no, no, no. It just so happens he's gifted at rap. We dealing with, you know. I mean, he's you dealing he, with one of the have-nots. Like, no, Mike. Like, like, like. You want to know what's wrong with Black America? What Black America does to Black men? There it is. That's why I loved it. I was like, yeah, look at what America does. To its black youth and it's downtrodden like, like oh no he that shit. he was Feel very real shit. he was very real yeah. and and you know yeah. i think 50 was very real too but i think 50 was more of like okay i'm gonna use this and i'm cognizant of what's going on and i'm no, no, going no. Here, to here, here, how about this mike this the the machine that snoop created for interscope is running on full throttle when 50 gets there that's what i'm talking oh, about yeah, yeah. that's why it's not the same dmx walked into a machine and the machine looked at him and was like okay we're gonna have to work some shit out because you're just too talented not to fit you in it's different right i mean let's just right. call it what it is def jam took a chance on x that other labels didn't because everybody knew the x was that dude i mean if you look at that rough riders uh chronicles he had been around the industry since like ninety two, but they yeah, but they could, and every opportunity was just you know just wasn't working because he couldn't stay out of trouble, you know. And Def Jam just took a chance and it worked finally. I mean, Mike, you want to talk about a chance? Like Irv Gotti took Leo Cohen to the fucking hospital with this nigga jaw wire. Like you know the story? He had robbed some dudes. Mm-hmm. And they, they, they like, him, jumped him or something. Him, yeah, they seen him back out on the street the next day up the street from where he robbed them at. Like, you know what type of dude that is, Mike, where you rob a nigga up the street and you up up the corner the next day like, what? <laughs> but you know what? I mean, a different dude. Irv uh, signed him as an A&R, but Irv never was going to sign X to his life. <laughs> Hey, Mike, biggest mistake of his career. Yeah, I guess. Maybe he just couldn't handle it, though. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's not like signing somebody that you know is going to be able to work out. Like, X was a big ch- risk to take. You have to have a lot of things in place for something like that to work. No, Mike. Because no, the Mike. Rough Riders had, DNY had them for years. And no, they were Mike. struggling. No, Mike. Mike, he's Randy Moss. But 19 teams were wrong. Very, very wrong. <laughs> yeah, but only a few people very, were able to wrong. make it work, too. You know what I'm saying? Like, Very wrong. Yeah, very it's wrong. Um, I mean, they were I'm, all wrong. I'm glad they, they took wrong. that chance. They were all wrong. He moved more units in one year than any MC ever had. They were all wrong. But see, this is the thing, Coop. I don't, think it's a, I don't think it's a right or wrong thing. I think people knew oh, X was that dude. You know what I'm saying? I don't think there was a mystery. I think that people just couldn't deal with the headache that w- that it was at that time. What, Mike? Mike, hold in on. and out of jail head. headache. Mike, Mike, listen, listen to what you're saying. You talking about they didn't want to deal with the headache of a rapper? What? Using narcotics, being in and out of jail, selling drugs. Like, are we fucking serious? Robbing, pe- robbing people. I ain't say didn't want to. I'm just saying I don't think they could. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like. 
What's that? Yeah, niggas be getting robbed. <laughs> I was just thinking, niggas be getting robbed. Like, <laughs> it happens. But I mean, it ha- right? It happens. When you hear exes stories, it's kind of like the MOP stories, right? I can't really put anything else close to it. Like no, most most rap she artists, most rap artists aren't as wild as that. Like you know what I'm saying? It'd be they entourage is wild like that. The actual the okay. actual art is a little bit more collected than that. X was different. Uh, yeah, I mean, he didn't really have a crew, though, Mike, so that was kind of the thing. I mean, you know? he was battling a lot, you know, and, and you know, not everybody wants to take that on. And I think they all knew what he would become, but or what he could become, the potential... People knew the potential, but even when people know the potential, that doesn't mean that they're going to put in the work to make sure that that potential materializes. And I think that's where X was. The guys knew that X was that dude. Albums and never hesitated. Because I was listening to, uh, what was that song? Um, ah, one of them songs that he did in 94 that he redid on, and then there was X. Um, Gotta Make a Move. That song was good. Like, the one that Irv Gotti produced originally. I got to make a move, make it smooth. Yeah. The original from, like, 94 was really good. So there's no way people didn't know that X had that level of talent. It was just, they just weren't, you know. It was hard to deal with all the other stuff. But DNY stuck with them. And, you know, they made history. But... I think that, yeah, when you talk about longevity and you talk about building up a wealth of catalog, all these things come into play. And I agree. That's why we did have Conway ahead of X. Um, You know, it's a different focus, you know, like if we're talking about just a straight up flat out talent list, then we might be talking about something different. But you have to. Here's the thing, Mike. Like, Conway has so many gems that people don't know about. Like, Mike, you're a Pete Rock fan. I just put you on the rare form off the black tape. Yeah. Most cats ain't even heard of rare form with Pete Rock from, from Conway. Like, like <clears throat> Pete Rock is one of those producers, Mike, that, um, like, you, pr- you you prove your MC weight on a Pete Rock track. Yeah. You know? Yeah. In rare form, like, one of those tracks where you can tell that, like, like Conway is trying to show cats, like, no, 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 I can flex on this track like some of your favorite rappers ever could. Yeah, yeah. And he does. And you know and what, and, I, and that's a good point, and I'm glad that people like Pete Rock and uh, Premier are still super active. Alchemist. Because, yeah, Alchemist too, because it can't be said that, oh, uh, this person's not around for you to rhyme over their beats. Like, yeah, the people... And they're still as good as they've always been. Like, the people that the other greats have rhymed over... Huh? What'd you say? I said... what? I said that Pete Rock and Premier and them are still... And Alchemist are still as good as they've ever been. So, it's not like, oh, okay, well, you're not getting... Are you sure about that? Are you sure about that? Are you sure about that? Who's not as good? I mean, I mean, if you... Are you sure about that when you say Primo and Pete Rock? Are they as good as they've ever been? I think Pete Rock is. If there's a question, it would be more premiere. I mean, to me, but you know, is that where you're going? I know premiere's your guy. I mean, I love Prem. You know how I feel about Prem. I mean, I love both. I love Pete Rock too, Mike. I'm, I'm, I mean, you know, okay. So like, like, quick shout out. Like, I was talking with Matt from the Yardies, and you know, every time I talk with him, he'd be like, "Yo," he was like, "Cool." He was like, you know. He's like, you know Pete Rock and Alchemist are a better like beat for beat than Preem is. It's just Preem got those haymakers that you can't forget. And like, yeah, but what I'm saying is is that it, aren't aren't Preem and Pete Rock more like album selection beat makers than the guy that you go to like you used to? I'm just saying. Well, I mean, that go to like you used to is all about who's hot, but we're talking about um, do they no, still? Mike, I, no, here, here, here's what I mean. It's like the albums decide. So, um, mm-hmm. so on "Pray for Paris," where would you put the 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 Primo Sean versus Flair track? Like, if you were ranking the album, where would that place in terms of the songs that you, you get? What I'm saying? Like again, you talking premiere, like but if we talking Supreme Blind Tell, Brutus is at the top. So. 
for Pete Rock. So yeah, you're no, talking no, about Mike, Premier. No, 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 Mike. Mike, I'm <laughs> actually, actually, Mike, I'm going to quib with you a little bit about that because I actually think the beat to Gods Don't Bleed, which is the track before Brutus, is a better beat. Mm. Andre says that uh, that track was just okay. He's talking about the um, From a King to a God track the premiere did. What do you think about that? Um, it was good. It was good. It wasn't great. It was a good beat, though. It was a great way to end the album. I love the feel and the vibe of the track to end the album like that. I thought it was appropriate where it got placed. So what, what, what do you think about that premiere track that he did for Griselda? And what do you think about that premiere track that was done on the list for Armani Caesar? Uh, Simply Dumb was some classic Preem shit, like okay. in a good way. It's like I didn't even know if he still made beats that sounded like that anymore. It was kind of good to hear him get in his bag like that a little bit. Like, didn't that sound like, you know what it actually sounded like? It sounded like something from the moment of truth, and I mean that in a good way. Okay. Um, well, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, he still has it in him. Like, it's not what's like... The joint? What's, the joint that, what's the joint that he did on the Griselda joint? Uh, What was the Griselda joint? I think it was a premiere joint. You remember when they... Um, it was oh, a, well, I know. I know what you're talking it was about. It a I'm video for it. It was a... Like, I mean, my, fa- my favorite record was Cruiserweight Coke. That's not the one I'm talking about. It was... Uh, Freddie High? Huh? That was... Freddie High Spot and Cruiserweight Coke were my favorites. Let me see. One second. I'm going to cheat real quick. Headlines is what I was thinking about. Yeah, yeah, that wasn't one of my favorites. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was good. That's what I'm saying. Like, like usually you're used to hearing stuff from them on an album, and you're like, whoa. And right. it's not, that doesn't happen as often anymore. What was the last so was, premiere track that made you feel like that? Because I think we can all agree that Alchemist might be as good, if not better, than he's ever been right now. As an executive producer, he's as good as he's ever been. Last mm-hmm. year was evidence to that. As a beat yeah. maker, yeah, he's somewhere in a really, really nice place. Yeah, where he might be making some of the most uh, s- sonically and creatively, he's in the best pace of his career, I think. Okay. Uh, um, I'm trying to think of a particular primo beat, but that's my thing with it, Mike. I can't think of something offhand for him. And Mike, prior to us really realizing that you know Pete Rock did Brutus, really wouldn't have a Pete Rock joint to give you offhand either. I got Brutus to give you now, but that's it. I don't know. We got to dig. Um, I'm just and, asking questions. I'm just asking questions. I love some Pete Rock <laughs> and Supreme. I don't even want to be disrespectful. Listen, like, I love. Gray, to Snoop, to various other legends that are on here. I love me Supreme and some Pete Rock. <laughs> I, listen, we love all of it. And I think that the uh, record that Pete Rock did with Sky Zoo was really dope. And I love the so, fact that Pete Rock still puts out beat tapes and stuff, too. Those are hard, too. Yeah. So, That's some hip hop stuff, yeah. Yeah, like, like Pete Rock is chilling, man. Like, but see, I think what Preem has is the fact that Preem worked very heavy in the '90s, so he has a lot to really stack up to. Whereas Pete Rock has just been great over a period of time, but not really one of those things where it was like he took over. You know what I mean? No, nah, Mike. I mean, it's really just. I mean, it's not a big J. Like Prem got the Nas Big and J records. Yeah, that matter. yeah. That's really, that's the separation yeah. between Prem and the other New York East Coast producers. It's like all those other guys could have like they probably if you were to stack all the songs up, they might go ten or twenty deeper songs. But then you go to like impactful songs, and he got like five to ten more impactful records than everybody else. Yeah, mostly because of those three guys in the you know. 10 to 15 odd songs he did with them three, you know? Well, Andre wants to know... His best getting star stuff, and it's like, okay. Andre wants to know, uh, how did y'all like the joint album that was produced for Smoke Dizza and uh, Benny the Butcher? I liked it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I liked it. I enjoyed it. I didn't think it was great. I thought it was a really good project. I mean, most of the stuff that Griselda puts out is really good. That's why we end up talking about them, because not only do they work... But they actually put together quality material. It's like even with this material, I was looking at this. So it's nine, it's ten tracks on here. It has right. one intro. There's nine songs. But most of this is Conway. I mean, it's yeah. got it's got four guest appearances on nine songs, and two of those guest appearances happen on one song. So this is Conway holding weight. You know, I love hearing solo MCs. Yeah, I told you, Mike. Like last year when we talked about who our favorite Griselda member was, it's like I told you Conway's the MC of the crew has in he sounds you the did. best by himself. I said that before from a king to a god came out. Yeah, you did. 
And before we get yeah. out of here, um, you know, Pusha T has a record coming out. Well, supposedly. Uh, people oh. are saying that they're in the studio with them and they've heard two records and it sounds on par, if not better, than Daytona. Um, uh, last thing that Pusha T said about the project was the fact that the only producers that were on it thus far were Kanye and the Neptune. So it sounds like it's just going to be and uh, a Kanye and Neptune thing. And when we say Neptune, we mean Pharrell and Chad. He made it very uh, specific and explicitly said that Chad was involved, which is a great thing, you know. So um, I think that, I don't know, man. Pusha T's been rhyming on a high level for a minute, and he's one of those guys that... 20 years. Huh? 20 years. 20 years. And he sounds better than ever. You know what I'm saying? It's like one of those things like when... To me, I know you say... Um, you would say something else, but I think Daytona is his best piece of work, in my opinion. Um, Solo work, yes. I, it's the best I've ever heard him. You know, obviously, you know... I, I don't know, man. I, I'm... <laughs> Mike, just... Mike, Mike, go listen to the intro. <laughs> The Hell Hath No Fury. Go listen to Keys Open Doors. Ride Around Shining. When, I, when, you don't, you, all right. Mike, Mike, you bananas, think, Mike. You think bananas, that I love Hell Hath No Fury. And I think Hell Hath bananas. No I think Hell Hath No Fury is crazy underrated. But you think Hell Hath No Fury is a better album than Daytona? I still think that, Mike, yes. Like, mm -hmm. okay, Mike, I want you to understand, rhyme pattern and sequence and skill-wise, what they were doing lyrically on that album, Cats had stopped doing, and they picked up the ball where everybody else had dropped it. And beat-wise, it is the Neptune's best production effort. I want people to listen to that again. Of all the Neptune's production effort, their best production effort from beginning to end is actually on Hell Hath No Fury. It's their most original score and piece of work lyrically malice and push a t are epic the strife is real the hustle is real the talk is real the album is foreshadowing of fortunate and unfortunate things to come like yeah mike it's great i tell you mike like right now how i feel about it it's the greatest rap album ever that nobody's talked about enough people That's don't really I hold it high it, and right? i and i think a big part of it is the fact it's that tripping. i think the, a big part of it is it, the time period it came out in um, another right. part is the fact that it wasn't the album that had grinding on it, unfortunately. He's Open Doors is better than grinding. That's crazy. But I think that... No, it's not. I think no, grinding... He's Open Doors. <laughs> what I'm saying, I think grinding was just... Better beat, too. I think grinding was so too. big. Grinding was so it's big. It's big. It's yeah. not better. Keys but I'm saying... Doors is better rhyme and beat. I will say this. I think that Mr. Same Me, too... Matter. I think Mr. Me Too was a very great first single to go with. That's what I mean, Mike. Yeah. That's a great first single. Like yeah. I, don't, I still don't know why that single didn't pop. Wamp Wamp's a great follow-up single. I don't know why that didn't pop. Mike, Trill would have been a great third single. I think Grindin' was just so big, man. I think that... Oh, Mike, it's one, the, it's one of the greatest rap records ever. But what I'm trying to tell you is that if it was actually like placing that song... There's like four or five songs on Hell Hath No Fury better than Grinding. Right. Better or we talk, I it's mean, better. Grinding is just it's a better. big song. man. It's like, it's one of those records that anybody would have problems following up. Even when, no. even when uh, Pusha and Drake were going back and forth. People who were pedestrian hip hop fans were like, I only know this guy from Grinding. Like, Grinding is like a cultural shift. And... You could put out incredible quality, but it gets overlooked when you have a record that's that big. You know what I'm saying? Like, And I'm not comparing them to Montel Jordan or anything like that. But even if Montel Jordan came with a classic R&B album after This Is How We Do It, it's just diff It's going to get overlooked. You got that record in your catalog. It's what it is. No, I get what you're saying, Mike, but that shouldn't take away from the brilliance of that album from beginning to end. The album, I mean, Mike, there's not a weak moment on the album. There's not a bad song. There's not a weak beat. There's not a bad lyrical performance. You know, there's not a dirt. It's 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 everything. It's a dizzy. It's a dizzy and rhyme display. Like like the flow patterns that they're using on that album are 
brilliant, Mike. I'm just telling you why it's overlooked. I mean, when I mean brilliant, Mike, I'm talking like like notorious B.I.G., uh, Rock M type brilliant bar pattern and sequencing and flow and delivery. Like, it's like that. Well, I'm just telling you why it was overlooked in that era. And I think that that is a big part of why Pusha T is able to flourish in this era so much. Because he doesn't have to deal with following up grinding on a radio level. Because he could just do his thing now. Yeah, you want to know what? You know what I do like, though? I like that Tona provided for him. I don't think people realize he's literally been going nonstop from pretty much from Lord Willing to the re-up gang mixtapes in mm-hmm. between, to the clips projects, to his personal mixtapes, to his personal projects, to some of Kanye stuff, to good music stuff, mm-hmm. back to his personal projects. After he made Daytona and got married and everything, that was the first time he's literally taken a break in about two decades. Mm-hmm. And so I'm excited. That's why I picked him to be MC of the year, Mike, because I know what his gifts are like. But I'm thinking like, oh, he finally got to sit down and rest and relax mm-hmm. and think and reset so when the guy is sending out that flyer talking about something he heard the first two tracks push is recorded and they're just they're on par with the two tracks from daytona i'm like no 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 that's about what i was counting on that's why i picked yeah. him to be the mc of the year this year even hold on mike knowing that conway was still in the zone i still picked push him as the mc of the year well you know because i would say not to interrupt you i would say that there has to be a there has to be an exhale moment after you drop an album like a Daytona, right? And like you said, you've been working so hard. It's almost like you finally win that championship. Now I'm you can sit you back to... and collect for real and enjoy this championship and enjoy everything that it brought and then get back to work, you, you know? You want to know what, Mike? Daytona did get the flowers that Hell Hath No Fury didn't get but deserve. Yeah. And it does seem like he felt better and more okay taking a break after that moment happened he really did and so daytona was important for his career because i think he felt more comfortable about his legacy and so i don't want to get shady when i say this Mm -hmm. but the main reason that cool g rap fell right outside of our 25 and the main reason that kane was literally the last person made our 25 is because they made no shit like Daytona, and Pusha didn't want to get Cool G wrapped specifically because that's more the branch of Tria style of music he comes off of. And so Daytona's super important because of that, because without Daytona, he's the modern-day Cool G rap in the great way, but also in the not-so-great way, where he's not going to be remembered as much, and folks going to look back and be like, where that classic classic at? Yeah. A lot of people, Cool G Rap's era think Road to Riches is a classic, but it hasn't carried over time. Like, Daytona's one of those projects, and that's what I mean. Kane or G Rap hasn't made a project like that. Mike, you heard Daytona after about two or three times. You knew it was about to carry. Oh, uh, and it did. I mean, I still listen to Daytona very Daytona, heavy, you know, right, and right. Um, it's brilliant. You know how I feel about what with me do. I was playing that yeah. yesterday. Yeah, I mean, it's just the timing of it all, too, and when it dropped how it dropped, and the effect. It it had a, a real huge impact, and it wasn't even one of those things where it was like because of the little jab at Drake. It was a big thing, period. And you could tell Kanye right. went all in as well to make sure that that's what it was. All the way down to the shock value of the album cover, which I don't totally agree with. Still disagree with the album cover to this day is a tacky ass move for. I told you, Mike, mm-hmm. it was the only tainted thing about that project to me. You remember my review? Yeah. I told you my biggest problem with the album was the cover. Yeah. And it still is because the album is a masterful piece of work. Mike had such a big fan of his. I didn't realize the impact it had on other people until the latter stages of this year because people talking about it. The way I talk about it, the way I talk about Hell Hath No Fear, and it was like, oh, it's like that? Oh, y'all all all fuck with Daytona like that, too? It's like, okay, yeah. Although I didn't agree with the album cover, although I didn't agree with the album cover either, I could see its influence when you look at, like, Pray For Paris' album cover, you know, Um, and just having a piece as an album cover and not to mention the tone not to mention the approach 
Not to mention this approach that everybody's coming with, you know, seven, ten songs or whatever. Get in, get out. Uh, Andre says, seven songs, nice, but it doesn't hold. I don't hold it hot. I'm sorry. But I don't hold it as highly. I Listen, I don't have a problem with the amount of songs, Very man. I really Very don't. Andre. I really don't have a problem. I really think that I wish more people would do less songs, to be honest. I mean, Mike, I want to hear you for 10 to 13 songs at the most if you really want to know the truth. Yeah. And you know what? And if a person does come with a, a longer effort and it's just straight fire, all due respect. It's respect, like like a Kumina, where it's like 72 minutes of just straight perfection. No, Mike. No, Mike. No, Mike. That's what I'm saying. A Kumina is still only about 13 <laughs> or 14 songs, though, and I don't want to hear more than that shit from you. Hold on. Be strong. Uh... Is, it takes away one track. Hold on, equipment has 16 songs, right? It's 16 songs, but I was saying like 72 minutes, though. It's just like, it's just... Oh. That's oh, a, yeah, Mike. That's no, a lot of time. Because usually 7 hour. to 10 songs is going to be around like 30-some-odd minutes. No, my, Mike, I think an hour and 20 minutes for me is the cutoff point, so equipment I'd be about an hour, 12 minutes, so you're right. After about an hour... Like, at an hour, I'm looking at you like this needs to be one of the best rap albums ever, like an Equimini or a Ready to Die. Yeah. I think what Outkast was able to do, they were able to give you a lot of variety. And when you have a long effort like that, you got to be able to kind of change up things for the listener. It can't just be beats and rhymes that whole hour and a half. I mean, a Spodioti changes things. A Liberation changes things. It's a break in there, you know? Well, Mike, well, I, actually, Mike, I was actually thinking in real time, if you go into the Hold On, Be Strong interlude, you count Spodioti, Dope Delicious, you count the interludes, you count Nathaniel, mm -hmm. you're actually only getting about 50 to 55 minutes of actual rap music. Yeah, exactly. You're getting, I mean, just, just between Spodioti and the interludes and the intros, about 12 minutes of music gone. Yeah, so and you're, you're going to... An hour. You're going to so chop Chunky Fi in half, too, because that last part... Because most that's of that's I mean. just the ride out. So yeah. it's only about 50 to 55 minutes worth of actual music on a Clem and I yeah. where you're listening to songs, which would make it seem about to a 10 to 13 track opus magnum. Well, I don't know what's about to drop next week. Uh, maybe somebody in the chat knows what's going to drop next week. But uh, I, this has been our first New Music Friday because January has been pretty much chill time for people. I guess everybody's collecting themselves. So um, January for Right. So, yeah, I mean, Conway set it off real big. Um, I think this new Ice Cube record, um, it was cool, too. What did you think about the Ice Cube record before we get out of here? Maintaining? Uh, um, I thought it was solid. I told you it was one of those uh, GOAT performances where it's like, man, like, didn't this dude start rapping, like, in 1986, 87? And yeah. he can still come out? And make a record this solid. I don't love the record. I like it. It's one of those performances where if Ice Cube is your favorite rapper, or if you think he's the greatest MC of all time, mm -hmm. this is some claim you can lay to that. The fact that he can step in the booth and make a track like this. I did. I mean, where where was he on our list? Like five or six? Something like that. As he, he should be. be. Yeah. As he should yeah. be. As he I, should be. Yeah. He said he has an album coming too. He wanted to be clear that what he was dropping today was a single. But he has like a full album coming, and I'm totally excited about, it, like and, I used to be. But and he also said that. Uh, well, I guess it was reported. I don't know if he said this, but TMZ reported that Joe Biden is going to sit down with him uh, with the contract with Black America. So um, I'm more excited about that, aren't you? Of course I am. Uh, we'll we'll see what happens. Though. Yeah, I think you and I have already <laughs> talked about how we, you know, you know, like Michael, I mean, you and I, we just not sheep, and that's where I'm going to leave it. Um, <laughs> I mean, I have no problem with a bipartisan bill, you know, and and the point of a bipartisan bill is for both sides to take a look at it, and... Hey, all I'm saying is, is, is that, I mean, people do understand that white people just rushed a Capitol building 
that upholds their systemic and institutional racism. It's the dumbest shit I ever seen. So at least somebody <laughs> with some sense gets to go sit down with somebody with some sense instead of that stupid shit we just seen. So mm. my question to you is, is what's your favorite track on uh, Conway's joint? Because one of the things that I really liked about it is that after listening to it the second time, it's like, ooh, I don't know what my favorite joint is. I don't either. Project. I like how he got, you know, deeper towards the end, but... He did. I like I, I like red beans. It's like a real grind. I like I like the grindiness of red mm-hmm. beans. I thought Toast Toast just had a, Mike. There were a couple moments on here where he was like on his big shit, like flow wise. Right. I was thinking that too, and I felt like that too. Um, you know, on the J I D record. About the flow. On the J I D record too. What you think about the J I D record, Mike? You and I talk. He's yeah. more big on that. I mean, I mean, how about this? As far as delivery goes, part of why I like Pusha T so much is that I think he has the best delivery of all the MCs that have come out post-2000. I'm going to have to start putting Conway right there. The J.I.D. performance, some big shit, like on some, I can rap over any type of beat yeah. at any type of pace and make it sound hot and still be myself. And I'm going to make that clear and still be myself. Like, he's still himself on that J.I.D. record when he... Yeah, because it was different, but... Yeah, I didn't know what to expect on that. I thought J.I.D. was going to come with, like, some, you know, lyrical gymnastic type track. Now, I do like... uh, I think so far on uh, the album, I'll say Kill All Rats might be my favorite song. I don't know. I like the hardcore stuff. No, no, no. I like Kill All Rats. It's just like, you know, I love hearing just Conway. I know, yeah. And obviously, yeah. And obviously they're doing some work with Ransom because, you know, Ransom was on Flea's project uh, last year on the Real Recognized Real joint because mm-hmm. Ransom made our um, top 20 uh, verses list. Speaking mm-hmm. of which, Mike, that's what we need to talk about before we go. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. What well, we need to talk about, yes, we uh, put together uh, a yearbook for 2020. 2020 was such an amazing year in hip-hop. Um, and we wanted to find a way to actually encapsulate that and put it in one tangible piece of literature because, you know, obviously magazines aren't in circulation and most of the news that we get is digital now. So basically what we wanted to do was come with one major publication for that encompasses the whole year. So we basically accumulated all the, um, the articles and, you know, the topics that were going through according to hip hop throughout the year that people were discussing hot topics and you know things that encompass the year of 2020 and it was a very active year when it came to music um so yes that should be released monday yeah yeah and uh, i'm ex- monday yeah yeah and we're going to be talking a little bit more about it once we actually have it in hand but yeah it's just getting at its completed state Uh, Because we wanted to make sure that we did the year justice and wanted to make sure we didn't miss anything. You know, R.I.P. saw the people that we lost in 2020, hip-hop, hip-hop and beyond. Uh, 2020 was a busy year when it came to protesting, to when it came to just a lot of music being released, a lot of quality music. And yeah, it was just a lot going on. Great quotables from, yeah, all generations. So that, Uh, go ahead. No, I just want to say, uh, you know, to uh, to the audience that's watching, like uh, Mike and I are serious about influence and cultivating the culture. Uh, we spent and probably spent about three months, I would say total, working on putting this yearbook together. Mike is always behind the scenes working in ways you guys don't ever really see. Even I don't see it half the time. But uh, hmm. this is a very, like, uh, important piece that we feel for the culture, for according to hip-hop. And really, it was uh, it was you all uh, and your feedback and your responses, not wow. when we started the podcast, but over the last few years, that really, like, motivated us to put it together. Uh, I'm going to speak specifically to this podcast briefly. Like, you know, I'm very contentious, and I love to debate hip-hop, but... Uh, we have real heads up here and we really know that you all love hip hop the way we do. And we put this together specifically for the people who we know are following and watching and love it the way that we do. And so like the book is something that we spent time working on for y'all. Like it's for the culture, but it's for the people that have supported according to hip hop, been watching us, been following us, was reading the articles before we ever went live. 
you know, supporting the trivia before there was articles. Like, like this is for y'all and for the culture. So, you know, uh, check us out soon and come and support. And we're going to have more things uh, coming down the pipeline soon. Yeah, and it's going to be an annual thing, too. You know, like, you know, when you're in school, you got the annual yearbooks. And um, <laughs> Andre says, uh, sell it. I'll buy it. Yeah, yeah, we, we'll have it on sale by next show. Yeah. Next show, you know, we'll definitely have a link on there uh, for everything. Uh, but, yeah. So, yeah, we wanted to, um, you know, year after year, we're going to do this annually. And so people have a collection of history being documented as it's being, as it's happening and as the history is oh. being made. So people won't be able to just go on to Wikipedia or whatever it will be in right. 10 years and go back and change history. You'll actually have history in right. a tangible form sitting there on your coffee table and you can actually open up that book of 2020 2021 and go through and see exactly what happened in hip-hop in those years so live like yep. like in real time in real and, time uh, i've experienced you know, just being right. here on this platform i've experienced people changing history that you know was different and, you know, we really experience, not to get into a whole rabbit hole, because I know we got to get up out of here, but oh, we oh, we it. see that with our forefathers of hip hop. And I follow a lot of them on social media. And, you know, everybody has a different take of how this thing came together. And I think that if things would have been documented properly at certain time periods, then we could have alleviated many of that. At this point, it's just, you know, I don't want to say hearsay, but you know, it's uh, it's undocumented. And when you have undocumented history, things get changed, and you know, and people will come in and say certain things happened that didn't, or people will say right. that certain things had an impact that they really didn't, or things that did have an impact didn't have that much. You know what I mean? So we figured we could alleviate that issue by just being able to encapsulate that year right after it happens. And put it in a tangible form for the people who have it. And hey, and I want to say something. Like people have to understand too. It's like you know, we putting our integrity on the line by uh, releasing this to a degree too, because we're putting our feet to the fire. Because you're not just getting a wrap up of the year, you're getting our list of albums ranked in order with explanations and ratings. Uh, what we think are the best verses, the best songs, the best guest appearances. So we're testing our integrity about it to see mm -hmm. how it's going to hold as well. Yeah, so it's not like true. and we just thrown together. We're putting our feet to the fire because, like, quite frankly, Mike, like, I mean, like, you see, like, Mike, I mean, the way, like, if Pray for Paris and From a King to a God now, Fredo don't hold up, I'm going to look like a fool. <laughs> right, right. But that's cool, right. man, and I love that, and that's one of the things that... that. You know, growing up, we loved the Source magazine, and the whole uh, mission was to get five mics right. One thing I didn't love, one thing I didn't love was when they went back and re mic things. And I was like, you know, you kind of got to let things sit where they stand. You gave Doggy Style four mics. You can't go back, or well, you shouldn't go back after the fact and change it to five. Like, you know, that's just part of history. Mike, they were so wrong so many times. They gave Doggy Style and Liquid Sword four mics. Like, what the fuck were they smoking? Like, mm. there wasn't even there wasn't even that much good weed back then. Like, for you to even make those kind of decisions. But that's fine, you know. No, people, it's not. Pe no, no, no. <laughs> no what I'm saying totally is, not. it's fine. People mess up, and sometimes you don't know for whatever reason those got Mike, four mics. Mike, what I'm saying, Mike, mess messing up and failing are two different. I things. hear Mike, you. You mess up and get a C. That's an F. I hear you, but what I'm saying is, if you mess up, stand on that. You can't go back and change that. Oh, no, 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 you're right. Stand you know what I'm saying? Like, like, here, here's what I'm going to say. Like, Part of the reason why I didn't rank from a king to a god ahead of Pray for Pairs is production-wise, I don't think some of those beats are going to hold up as long as the beats on Pray for Pairs. I actually think the production job in Alfredo and Pray for Pairs were better and beat wise are going to hold up longer. It's Conway's epic performance of the mic that put from a king to yeah. a god that way. And so now, over a course of time, we'll see if it takes on some of that ready to die, illmatic, reasonable doubt type of way. Yeah. Well, that's the chance you take, you know, and we're willing to take that chance for the love of the culture and to, you know, actually try pushing it forward in that way. But yes, your book on the way it should be uh, up and available for sale. You know, y'all follow According to Hip Hop, so y'all will see exactly when it's up and ready for sale. But 
definitely by next show it will be you know able to be ordered and delivered to your home and you oh. know we and will it's have almost 200 pages you're not getting shorted on material it's almost 200 pages worth of material oh yeah and it covers everything you know if you right. follow according to hip hop you know we kind of we cover everything in the scope of hip hop it was derived from the topics that we already take on um, to everything that you know the people talk about like you said it was it was a collection of things that you guys talked about throughout the year and things that were heavy in the news and you know many things that artists stood on talked about the music it was a busy year y'all knew it y'all know it but yeah hey mike you want to know what's funny is everything kind of comes full circle do you remember when you first started this and the tagline on facebook uh used to be according to hip-hop where you the people decide and yeah. you've really stuck to the mantra, and we really have been letting people decide. Sometimes for the worst. I made some decisions on my list based on what y'all told me on here, and I said that. <laughs> You got to listen and to I the people. And I made a bad decision. I shouldn't have put juvenile hell on over lemon. I'm so tired of y'all. <laughs> All right, man. Well, next week, hopefully we got some new music, and can't wait to talk about more. All right. You too, fan. Oh, y'all be busy out. Hold it down, Appreciate y'all. the love. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah.